Hi, I'm Nikki Schultek, and uh, today it is my absolute pleasure to join the symposium. Thank you so much, Lavinia, and everyone who is presenting today and moderating. Uh, it's my privilege to announce uh, Dr. Matthias Kliegel from the University of Geneva, who will be presenting today on how cognitive reserve affects healthy cognitive aging. Matthias, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I also thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and uh, it's an honor to kick off uh, this symposium with a presentation co-authored by Andreas Ehle, who is a senior postdoc at the Gerontology Center that I'm directing um, at the University of Geneva. The work I'm presenting um, is been, has been conducted in the context of uh, the NCCR LIVES. Um, it's a research uh, program um, in Switzerland and it's been funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the uh, um, Fondation Lenartz in a project together with uh, Bogdan Draganski and uh, Silvia Stringini. Um, so the uh, basic research question, the background that we have been addressing over the last uh, um, years um, is motivated by the enormous differences between individuals um, when it comes to cognitive aging. And what you see here is uh, just a plot of a test on processing speed in a study that uh, we um, are conducting. It's a national cohort of uh, more than 3,000 older adults in Switzerland. And you see, even though there is a clear age-related trend in processing speed, which is uh, well known, you also see there's a huge difference between um, the individuals. And uh, what we often find is that um, individuals within one age groups, like the 80 or 90 year olds, they differ among each other more than the average mean level differences between the younger and the older participants. And the key question that uh, has been uh, motivating the research I'm presenting is uh, what's behind that? What drives those differences in cognitive health and cognitive aging? And one of the uh, um, to, uh, um, main hypothesis that has been motivating our work um, is uh, the cognitive reserve um, hypothesis. And here, a very classical uh, view of that uh, um, proposed by Stern and colleagues is that cognitive reserve postulates that individual differences in the cognitive processes or neural networks underlying task performance allow some people to cope better than others with brain damage or as uh, we can say in the context of cognitive aging and um, to cope better with age-related neural changes. And this is one of the prominent figures in that area that probably most of you will know. And the idea is that uh, individuals uh, start at a different level of cognitive functioning due to um, factors to be determined and that then um, due to uh, neurological damage or age-related um, neurological changes, they drop in performance and uh, depending on the starting level, they may fall below a functional threshold um, earlier or later um, than others. And the key question in that context that has been motivating our work and others is that what's behind that? What are the, what are the sources of those individual differences? Is that simply a starting level that's different? <clears throat> when and how are they um, acquired? when and how do they emerge those differences and what domains play a role here is it really just uh, intellectual or is it or perhaps also social economic or a diverse experience that contribute to, to those differences so a few years ago we proposed um, that this is actually a lifespan life course uh, process that we would should look at and that there are multiple reserves across different domains that interact and the idea here is that Across the entire lifespan, um, uh, we work on our brain um, across different domains, um, intellectual, but also social, economic uh, context factors that um, allow us to cope uh, more or less successfully with, with adverse life events and uh, other processes. And that some people then, um, due to those experiences, manage to go back to normal, to baseline or a little bit lower. Some would fall into a state of vulnerability and at some point some people would fall below a breakdown line. And that this is um, actually important to consider when we try to understand cognitive aging um, has been shown across a number of variables. So this is work um, mainly conducted by Andreas Ile that I mentioned uh, earlier 
um, that has shown across the entire lifespan that different factors, the most well studied probably being education in childhood, but also engagement and leisure activities, more or less intellectual stimulating, socially stimulating across middle adulthood, cognitive level of job across the entire adult lifespan, but also um, factors that are measured at retirement age, like speaking or learning different languages are affecting cognitive aging. So in that context, um, what ha we have been uh, looking at is actually um, elucidating more uh, the pathways um, into these built up processes of cognitive reserve. Because that there's in fact of education and lifelong activities, this is uh, now relatively well accepted. But what is much less well understood is whether cognitive or other reserves can counter strong um, physiological stresses. Um, what is the moderator role of reserves? And looking from a mediation perspective, through which detailed mechanisms do cognitive and social reserves help to overcome cognitive vulnerability? Just to give you a few research examples. So here, um, a number um, of studies in that regard have shown that actually there is a significant moderation effect um, of um, the effect of physical stressors, um, like here in that context, uh, obesity on cognitive um, performance, cognitive aging, by markers of cognitive reserve. What we have shown here is that in individuals with low and vocational education and with little activity engagement across the adult lifespan, obesity was significantly related to lower cognitive performance. But it was not the case in individuals with higher advanced education and with greater engagement and leisure activities in midlife. So that these direct effects of risk factors only emerge in certain subgroups of older adults and that these are characterized by these cognitive reserve markers. Open questions in that context remain, are there critical periods? Are there cross domain interactions? What about threshold? When do they affect those? When do these effects emerge? And uh, just to give you a bit of uh, um, some highlights here, we have shown this for different uh, factors, obesity, different chronic diseases, hypertension, cholesterol, frailty, but uh, also other um, conditions. So they, these effects emerge quite, quite uh, substantially and quite robustly. Important in that context is that it's not just affecting cognitive status, the cognitive performance levels, but it also affects cognitive change. So in this publication, for example, and, and similar others, uh, we have shown that, um, that these um, detrimental effects of uh, physical stressors do affect cognitive decline, but this is moderated by cognitive reserve markers. So these decline um, trajectories were different um, when we compared individuals with less or higher engagement in cognitively stimulating activities. Coming back to the theoretical proposal, the idea is that it's really important to not simply look at education or not simply look at a certain level of job at a given time point, but to really look at different trajectories across the entire life course and to do so across different domains. What we have recently um, looked into is the interaction of different uh, um, factors in the cognitive reserve uh, literature. So here, just an example, there is an important effect, not just of cognitive reserve, but also what we could say is very much related to social capital or what we call relational reserves. So that cognitive aging is markedly different according to the interaction of cognitive reserve built up across the lifespan, but also the relational reserves that people acquire across the adult lifespan. So the idea is that we basically um, aim to model the entire um, lifespan built up processes across different domains from childhood across adolescence into adulthood and old age and look at the different interactions of these reserve factors on cognitive aging. 
We have recently, in the context of the LENAS project that I have uh, briefly mentioned, um, showed that this is actually important that we distinguish different life course phases. So this is a, um, a study that has uh, looked at the different factor um, across childhood, across adulthood, but also across late life on cognitive aging, in that case, prospective memory, but also subjective memory um, in old age. And what was shown is that specifically um, the adult with lifespan was important um, as a predictor for objective um, prospective memory performance. And that subjective memory complaints is rather explained by other um, factors uh, like depression. So important here to disentangle these life course phases but also control for them um, at the same time. So this is work uh, um, done by Morgan Künzi, one of my current PhD students in that context that you see also on, on that slide. To wrap up, um, what we are currently looking into are the factors that determine um, the cognitive reserve build up across the lifespan um, that we look at the longitudinal changes um, of cognitive reserve and the outcome in cognition, that we more fine in a more fine-grained way look into the behavioral and brain mechanisms um, of those cognitive reserve markers. But as I said, um, still um, we believe it's important to look across different domains um, and look at other reserve um, factors. Uh, I've shown you an example for social reserve but there's also um, work going on on economic and emotional reserves and that uh, we believe is important to um, put into the picture. Um, as I also said, what is important is to look at different life events, adversity factors that are the other coin, uh, um, the uh, other side of that coin. So how can reserve also be dampened by different uh, um, life events? And then um, a, a recent addition in that context, what is important is can we induce in a certain way cognitive reserve? Can we train those um, build up processes specifically? Um, and then obviously important here when, how, um, and what is the dosage in that regard that um, is important to consider. And here I stop. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Matthias, thank you so much. Do we have any questions from our audience? Uh, you may post it in the chat if you have any. So Matthias, I don't see any questions just yet, but something that I'm thinking about while you're speaking, um, when you refer to the leisure activity portion of your talk, I'm really thinking a lot about um, you know, failure to thrive in infant babies, right? When, um, when infants don't receive a proper amount of physical affection, emotional connection to um, parents or any adult, um, you know, they, they don't develop cognitively in a normal way. So I'm wondering if within this leisure activity portion, if you thought at all about the interpersonal sort of human relationship connection, because there has been research done on um, healthy aging and an adequate amount of social interaction? Absolutely. I think that's a really important point. And this ties into what I briefly mentioned at the end, the work on adversity experiences. And here we see, and that's a current uh, study that we are running together with our consortium uh, using the SHARE data um, to look at these different uh, adversity or, or, or more optimal ways of being raised um, and also kind of uh, um, dovetail this with other um, other experiences across the entire lifespan. And here we do see that very early in life, um, these pathways can be set into the right or the wrong direction. And we do see that early childhood adverse experiences um, like parental um, neglection or hunger um, a financial hardship at childhood that may have these consequences do um, um, set the path and to the wrong direction. And it's difficult to compensate that later on. Well, thank you so much, Matthias. We will conclude this session and I will be entering the next session to introduce our next speaker. 
Uh, Ted, I see your question in the chat and perhaps we can save it for the very conclusion of this session and we will address it at that time. Thank you so much, Matthias. Thank you.